Well, I'm Jeff Forrester. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're so glad that you decided to come and celebrate Christmas with us as we talk about peace on earth. That song was uh, written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. That's a hard one to get out. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, one of the great lyricists, one of the great poets in American history. And it's a true story, uh, connected to a true story of pain and hope that really culminated on Christmas Day, 1863. A couple years before that, his wife, Fanny, had, uh, uh, he woke in, uh, from a nap. He could hear her screams, and she had uh, caught her dress on fire. And so he rushed out, and he tried to smother the flames with a rug, and that didn't work. And finally, he tried to smother the flames with his own body, and he held her uh, as she died. And he wound up being so severely burned, that's why he grew the big beard and all the things that he was famous for. So then a couple years later, his, uh, the war between the states broke out, north and south, and all of the tumultuousness of that day, and uh, his son ran away from home and joined Lincoln's army uh, and decided to fight for the north, and um, that was a struggle for him. He, he struggled with losing his wife, and in his faith, he struggled with that, and then uh, with the, the war going on, the hatred between brothers, literally, in our nation at the time, and uh, so much political discord and all those kinds of things, he was really just emotionally, spiritually struggling, and then he gets word in uh, December of 1863 that his son, who had been an, was an officer in the Union Army, had been shot. He was shot through the shoulder on this side. The bullet came out the back of the shoulder on that. That side, and uh, they thought perhaps he was going to be paralyzed for the rest of his life. And so here is a guy that is struggling with his oldest son being uh, wounded, this battle between the North and the South, all the political dissonance going on in his nation that he loved, the social collapse that was happening around the, around the country, the racial injustices which just infuriated him, uh, the violence that ensued, and then ultimately almost losing his own son. He felt like giving up, and it was in that context that he sits down and writes the lyrics, in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's, many people could say that's very similar to the country we're living in today, right? That hate is strong and it mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then uh, just a, a day or two later, he steps out, heading on his way to church uh, on Christmas morning, and he hears the church bells ringing in the town, and, and he hears the voices in the churches singing these glorious anthems about peace on earth, goodwill toward men, and he was confronted with this truth. Peace cannot, it does not come and cannot come from governments of men, but from the king that was born on that first Christmas night. And he knew that peace came in the form of a baby. And the Christmas bells reminded him of the angel's first glorious announcement to all the people, this announcement of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And so he sat down and wrote, then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth goodwill to men. So here's a guy that's caught up in the realities of life, right? Losing a wife, having a son injured, living in a nation that was coming apart at the seams. He was confronted with those realities along with the fact that God's not dead. He, he recognizes that we're in a battle, you and I, we're in a spiritual battle. We're in a battle between good and evil, between light and dark, between chaos and peace. And we're real players in this battle. And victory is possible because of what happened on that first Christmas night. On that day, as, as well as just about every Christmas ever since, Luke chapter 2 winds up being read in most churches around the world. Christians remembering that holy day. So if you want to, grab your notes out of your program. I'll help you fill in a few of the blanks. The verses are in there. We'll put them up on the big screen too. Here's what Luke chapter 2 says. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to who? All people. That's right. How many of you qualify in that statement? All people. How many of you? All y'all are people, right? <laughs> All people. Good. He says, so this is good news, which will be a great joy for all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
And this will be the sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. On that morning Jesus was born, God became a man, and he brought peace with him. Peace is possible because of the peace that he brought for you and for me. And this announcement was brought, I love this, was brought to ordinary shepherds. It wasn't brought to the palaces. It wasn't brought to the universities. It wasn't brought to the social elites. It was brought to the everyday normal shepherd. And God was announcing that peace, inner peace, peace with God, peace with people was available to everybody for all the people. And so on that very first Christmas and every Christmas since, Jesus offers us peace with God and he shows us the way to peace with each other, how to have internal peace as well. And so that's what we're going to talk about. As I mentioned, this battle uh, that we live in between good and evil, between light and dark, between peace and chaos, you and I are real players in it. And we have a big part with regard to being agents of peace or agents of anger and hatred those kinds of things. So God makes it possible for us to have peace with him. And because of that peace that we can have with him, you and I can have internal peace as well, personal peace, and then we can extend that peace. So I want to talk from both ends, the, the, the peace that God brings to us and the peace that God encourages us to bring to the world as well because we're his agents. And so if you're uh, following along, peace on earth starts with me, much of it, much of the peace starts with me. I choose whether or not to extend peace towards others. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 12. He said, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Go ahead and circle the words, if it is possible. I had, I've had people point that out this weekend. It's not always possible, <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about. I don't even have to point it out. You're already thinking. Sometimes it's not possible to have peace with some people. But he does say, as far as it depends on you. This is that time of year, right? You've already had it happen. You're sitting in the driveway. Your spouse looks at you and say, don't even bring that up this time right? <laughs> we have this time when the whole rest of the year, you can find ways to dodge your in-laws and your outlaws, right? You can find ways to not have to be around, but at Christmas, you're just kind of stuck with it. And you got to smile and grit your teeth and say, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Somebody's going to say something dumb about some politician. Somebody else is going to say something dumb about, they're mad about something. We're all mad. Everybody's mad. How many of you are mad? Are you mad about something? You want to protest anything? We're all mad. Let's just be mad, right? That's the way America's gotten. We're mad about everything all the time. The Bible says sometimes it's not possible, but if it is possible, and then he certainly says as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I don't know if you knew this. Did you know you don't have to read everything everybody types in caps? <laughs> Did you know that? Do you know you could turn the TV off? You don't have to watch the news. You don't have to. You don't have to sit through another conversation of people complaining about every little detail. You don't have to. So as much as it depends on you, you can choose peace. But man alive, sometimes our adrenaline gets going. We want to get in there and we're right and these morons are so dumb. And if we can just give them, I don't know if you're allowed to call people morons and dumb at Christmas time at most churches, but you can't hear. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm going to get, people are going to send me emails tomorrow. You're not allowed to say dumb more. It's going to be dumb morons sending me emails this week saying I'm not allowed to say that in church. No, I'm joking. Shouldn't say that. I should have better manners. At least at Christmas. Life is too short to get caught up in everybody else's drama. Right? I, I had a friend, he was in Washington, D.C., and he was uh, by, the, um, uh, by the White House, and there were a bunch of people protesting. There was a sign on the ground. He just picked up and was protesting too. He didn't even know what he was protesting about. He looked at the sign. It was some kind of Vietnamese rights or something like that, right? And he's, he's protesting out there. We just get caught up in it sometimes. Sometimes it just happens because everybody else is mad. We're going to get mad too. Everybody else has a crisis. It's our crisis too. Everybody else has a cause. It's going to be my cause too. And so people live so much of their life today without a whole lot of peace. And it's because we're not choosing, as far as it depends on you, to live at peace with everyone. Life is too short to get caught up in all this junk all the time. It really, hey, here's a verse that reminds me of that all the time. Psalm 39, David says, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered and that my life is fleeing away. Merry Christmas, by the way. <laughs> I know that was like, oh, that verse just warmed my heart. I'm not going to live very long. 
But life isn't that long, right? Life is short, and I don't want to get spend my life getting pulled into everybody else's drama all the time. So they come to Jesus, and you know, I'm a simple person. I just want the simplest version of things. And they come to Jesus and say, Jesus, what is the simplest way to view what God has for us? What's the greatest commandment? That's what they're saying. Tell us the big one. And Jesus said, actually, there's two. They're flip sides of the same coin. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And love your neighbors yourself. You can't separate the one from the other. Right here in Mark chapter uh, 12, Jesus says that. Love your neighbor as yourself. So as far as it depends on you, you can choose peace. As far as it depends on you, you can't control other people's comments. You can't control other people's attitudes. But you can control yours. You can manage yours. And so uh, I think uh, it's a good reminder that we can choose peace even when other people don't want to be. Have have you ever tried to get in an argument or get in a fight with somebody who doesn't want to fight? You know how like disappointing that is, right? Because you're coming in just jonesing for a fight. I've had that happen before where I'm just, you know, wanting to argue. I come in, want to argue with my wife and she's like, oh honey, here's some mashed potatoes. And it just makes everything better, (laughs) right? You don't want to fight. It's hard to fight when, you know, it takes two. You know that, right? It takes two to fight. And if you're the one who chooses peace, it might make them a little madder. But at least you're not caught up in all that drama. So peace on earth starts with me. I did a a Google search because Google never lies. And so I did a a, a Google search on uh, peace of mind. And it was so funny because I thought, oh, I'm going to get all this really great insight on how to have peace of mind. The first seven things that came up were companies. They were businesses that came up. Uh, Peace of mind therapy and stress reduction. Peace of mind home care services. Peace of mind assisted living. Peace of mind home inspections. Peace of mind real estate. peace Peace of mind paralegal. So if you need good peace of mind with your real estate and paralegals, they're on the internet. But if you're looking for something more than just what Google has to offer, those are the first ones. Then they take you into all the Zen Buddhism and all these other things on there. But those were the first six or seven. Here's what I want to give you. I want to give you four steps to personal peace that God offers us. So as you choose personal peace in your day-to-day life, the way that you're living with other people, you can also find God's peace in your life. We'll talk about that towards the end. And when I talk about peace, I'm not talking about problem-free living, right? Let's not be so naive as to pretend like if, if, uh, if we could finally get God, the great genie in heaven, poof, to give us all our greatest desire, finally there'll be no more problems in life. As a matter of fact, Jesus says it the opposite. Jesus said, listen, in this life, you're going to have trouble, right? But Jesus came to overcome our trouble. Jesus came to give us peace in the storm. There's a, a, a part of Jesus' life, it's in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four uh, histories of Jesus. And uh, they tell of an event one time where Jesus was sleeping. He was sleeping in the bottom of the boat. And he was traveling with his followers. And a bunch of those guys were professional fishermen. They'd lived on that lake for their whole life. But a big storm blew in and it was really freaking the guys out. So they come down in the bottom of the boat and say, Jesus, how can you sleep during this horrible storm? Because Jesus isn't afraid of a storm, right? He's the God of the storms too. So Jesus steps up, lifts his hands and says, peace, be still. The Bible says immediately the storm calms, everything's okay. So God doesn't say that there's not going to be storms in your life, but he does say that Jesus can bring you peace. My oldest son, Jonathan, he was obsessed with Batman when he was three years old. And he always was running around Batman costumes. And uh, so we were living in Texas. We just taught that story to him. And uh, so then he's playing out in the front yard. He's playing in our driveway. And uh, there's a storm coming in. My wife comes up. She says, Jonathan, the storm's coming in. I want you to come in the house. And he's like, oh, mama, the storm's blowing. And he's blowing him towards the road on his tricycle, right? And oh, the storm's blowing. I can't come in. She said, Jonathan, you come in right now. And he's like, I can't do it, mama. Batman can't fight the storm. And she says, you come in this house right now or you're going to get a time out. And he stands up and he goes, peace, be still. (laughs) Then he fixed his little cape and he grabbed his tricycle and says, that worked. (laughs) That wasn't exactly what we were trying to teach him. We were trying to teach him that Jesus brings peace in the middle of the storm. So I want to give you four Steps to personal peace that God says, listen, if you go my way, I'll bring peace in the middle of storms of your relationships. And then we'll also finish up with how to have peace with God. Sometimes, you know, our relationships are being torn apart um, 
sometimes because we're so passive, we're not willing to engage and have the hard conversations. Other times it's because when we finally do blow up, we destroy everything. So I'm not saying go and sit down at Christmas dinner and have some kind of massive confrontation. But if you want next year's Christmas dinner to be better, maybe at some point you need to have a moment when you sit down and really talk these things through. But you have to do it humbly. It it requires a certain amount of humility. So if you're going to fill in the blanks, confront humbly is the first one. We all get brought into these things. We, we all have issues, family members, friends, whatever. We have hurt feelings. We've hurt them. They've hurt us, whatever. And Jesus puts a very high priority on us having things right between each other. So much so. You want to know how big of a priority God puts on you having things right between you and your brother and you and your father, mother, and you and your sister and your friends and your neighbors? Human relationships. You want to know how important human relationships are? Jesus said, go get it right with each other before you come in and try to worship. Here's what he said. Look at this. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. And first, go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So Jesus says, listen, one more worship song isn't going to change your life right now. Hearing Jeff's amazing Christmas message (laughs) probably is not going to change your life today nearly as much as you firing off that text and saying, I want things to be right between us. Maybe that phone call. Maybe that gentle conversation, that humble conversation. Now, look, look at, would you circle a word? There's a really important word there. Um, first, go and be reconciled. Would you circle the word reconciled? <clears throat> There's a big difference between reconciliation and resolution, right? Sometimes, the reason why we keep fighting about the same thing, both of you are decent human beings. Both of you, God loves both of you. You know that, right? When you're fighting. So God loves the one you're fighting with as much as he loves you. And so you're both, uh, you know, have your perspective. Neither one of you is seeing it the same way the other one is. And so uh, at, at a point then, what happens is we want resolution. And so we rehash the problem over and over and over again. And we're trying to have a winner, you, trying to be the winner, which requires a loser, and that very rarely ever brings people together when you force somebody else to lose, right? So when you're looking for reconciliation, coming together, the relationship is more important than the resolution. And so Jesus is saying, hey, you go, go reconcile. You know, I don't have to hold you guilty all the time just because you are. I don't have to punish you just because I deserve to punish you, right? I can choose reconciliation over resolution, and that's okay. The relationship is far more important, and this is what Jesus says. Listen, don't come and keep worshiping. Don't keep coming and pretending like everything's okay in your life. Leave your gift to God. Go solve it. Go resolve it. Not even resolve it. Go reconcile it, and then come back in worship. This is what Jesus is saying, the flip side, love God, love people. You can't say you do one without the other, right? It requires both. And so we got to confront humbly. Uh, The other one is this, and these go hand in hand. We have to love deeply. The thing that would drive us to reconciliation over resolution is the fact that we love deeply. And love is a choice, right? Look what he says, Peter, one of Jesus' great followers. Peter gave up, gave up everything to follow Jesus and then wound up becoming one of the great leaders in the early church. And he says, uh, above all, which this really gets my attention. You know, there's 31,000 verses in the Bible. There's a lot of words. Uh, have you ever seen one? They're like this big, right? Big Bible. There's, there's a lot of words. And so when I see a, a verse in the Bible that says, above all, that's kind of like cliff notes on the Bible, right? Okay, this is a big one. That's it. He says, above all, love each other how? Love each other deeply, right? Because love covers over a multitude of sins. I had somebody in the earlier service, Jeff, said, Jeff, I really like it when you wear a blazer. Man, that's a nice little pocket square you got there. And I said, it's because blazers cover a multitude of sins. That's why I'm not trying to be cool. So love and blazers cover a multitude of sins. You can choose which one you're going to use. But he says, above all, the most important thing, love each other deeply. Love's a choice. You choose shallow relationships or you choose deep relationships. Deep relationships take work, but they're worth it. And then he says it covers a multitude of sins. When I choose love, when I choose to love you deeply, I choose our relationship over my right to punish you and prosecute you 
for your imperfections. Does that make sense? So when I choose love, I'm choosing not to punish you. Which, by the way, there is no real satisfaction in that. We all know that. When we finally were able to get revenge, it kind of felt like there's still an emptiness in there. This is what God did for us. God chose not to get revenge on us when we sinned. God chose instead to demonstrate his love for us in extremely radical ways as he chose to uh, extend forgiveness, as he chose to pay the price for our sin uh, through Jesus. And so this possibility, this ability to choose love over punishment, this ability to choose love over having to win comes from God. Here's what he says, we love each other because he first loved us. So maybe a reasonable prayer as you're heading into Christmas or into some gathering that you're going to be in, maybe a reasonable prayer is just to throw it up to God and say, God, help me to love them like you love me. That might be it. Give me your peace when I'm going into this because there's somebody's going to say something dumb, something's going to happen. So help me love them like you love me. Because we love each other because he first loved us. And then I think it's important as we come to Christmas time to remind ourselves to share generously. Love gives. God so loved the world that he gave, the Bible says. Uh, Real love causes us to give. It's about the other. It's not about me, right? And so when we learn to share generously, uh, it really helps us begin to release materialism. Materialism really just drives a lot of our dissatisfaction. You know, I've been in places in the world where they just didn't even know. I've been in places in the world where they didn't know what we could offer, right? So there was no begging. That's pretty amazing. If you travel a lot of places, a lot of begging, they just want something. But I've been in places where they had no concept. There was no idea. And, and so they had no idea what they were missing. And so you know what? It turned out they were pretty happy people. So much so, I, I was sitting in one village. I wasn't even sitting. I was trying to sleep. It was like about 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. The sun was down. We'd worked really hard that day. It had been really, really hot outside. We had a lot of work the next day. And these people, they don't even have television. They don't even have the ability to stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning watching info commercials. Right? They don't even know what they don't have. They don't even have any salad shooters. Not, I didn't see one salad shooter in the whole village. And these people are sitting around the fire singing at like 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, the whole village. I'm like, shut up. I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of times our dissatisfaction comes from the fact that we know that other people have more than we do. Rather than being thankful for what we do have. Right? We don't have to be ashamed of what we have. God says he gave all those things to us to enjoy. We can enjoy them, but we just have to understand we've been blessed to be a blessing. Sometimes, though, it gets easy, especially at Christmas season, to get caught up in the traditions, to get caught up in the ritual, to get caught up in the religious aspects of the holiday, doing all of our ceremonies and all of our traditions. And sometimes we can forget the real meaning for the season, my wife likes to do um, uh, Christmas mass, you know, so, so sometimes she'd pack us up and we all go. And, and, you know, Heritage doesn't have tons and tons of tradition like that. So we'll go to a really traditional church and sit there. And uh, one time my boys, they just didn't want to go. My kids were just dragging their feet at midnight. They didn't want to go. Tomorrow morning is Christmas. What are we doing going to Christmas mass, right? So she drag us in and then they're just laying on the pews and they're miserable, all dressed up and all that stuff. And, and then, uh, you know, we're not very good parents. I'm not anyways. My wife is, but I'm not a good parent. I, I should have prepared my kids ahead of time, but they didn't know it was happening. So all this ceremony was happening. It's like, what's happening now? I'm like, shh, what's happening now? Why is he doing that, right? And then one of the people in the ceremony, they come by and swing in the incense. You know what I'm talking about? The, the incense thing like that? Swing it like right in front of my, my son's face. And he goes, oh, pff, <laughs> what was that? And I'm just like, oh, I'm a terrible parent. But is that really why Jesus came? Did Jesus come to earth to make us sit through one really long, boring religious service once a year and be miserable, sitting on the hard pews? One time, uh, my wife and I were sitting in the service and uh, we were sitting in long pews like that. And all of a sudden we see people's head just like start popping up like that. I look and one of my boys is missing. He's climbing underneath the pews (laughs) all the way to the front. Right? That's God's plan, just to have you be bored and miserable in church. That was why Jesus came. So there's a passage that really gets my attention in the book of Isaiah. God is not saying tradition is not important. He's not saying rituals aren't important. But he is saying sometimes you replace the important things 
with the rituals. Like all of a sudden the rituals are most important. God says, stop it. Get back to what's most important. He's talking about generosity. Look what he says here. He says, what makes you think I want all your sacrifices, says the Lord? I'm sick of your burnt offerings. When you come to worship me, who asks you to pray through my courts with all your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgusts me. I wonder how he really feels, right? <laughs> As for your celebrations and your special days for fasting, they're all sinful and false. And I want no more of your pious meetings. I hate your annual festivals. They're a burden to me. I can't stand them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. And then look what he tells us. Learn to do good, so live a decent life. Seek justice. The world's full of injustice. He said you should be agents of justice. Help the oppressed the marginalized, the forgotten, the ignored in society, the disadvantaged. Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. It's that simple. God says, you really think what I want is one more pompous ceremony? One more religious, warm, fuzzy feeling for you? That's what I want? That's not why we did this. That's not my mission for you. He said, what I want is for you to live a just life and for you to be an agent of justice. What I want for you is to help the oppressed and to defend orphans and to fight for the rights of widows, for those that everybody else is ignoring. Let your faith change your life. Don't just talk about your faith. Don't just celebrate your faith. Don't just feel your faith. How about live your faith? That's what God's saying. And at Christmas, maybe this is one of the best times for us to remind ourselves the importance of living out our faith. This is why we did that whole Change for Churches campaign that Chris was talking about earlier, right? We want to get our families involved. We want to get our our young people contemplating the idea that you've been blessed, but you've been blessed to be a blessing to others as well. So how can we make a difference? Uh, Through the churches, we help start churches in about 40 countries uh, through the Timothy Initiative. And through those churches now, we're helping serve 19,000 widows and orphans. Right? That's what God's saying I want you to do. I want you to help people. I want you to use what you have to make a difference for other people. Here's what he says in Micah. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly. To love mercy. Mercy is you caring for those who can't care for themselves. And to walk humbly with your God. And then lastly, if you're filling in the blanks, all these kind of lead to this one. And that is, we have to come to the point, and I've already talked about this, but we have to come to the point where we're willing to forgive irrationally. Look what Paul tells us. Bear with each other and, give, and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Uh, which grievances are we supposed to, to, to forgive? Whatever, right? Whatever. That covers them all. And here's the reason why. He finishes it with this. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Remember, we love because God loves us. And now he says, forgive as God forgives you. In the same way, this is one of those uh, opportunities for you to, to be more like God when you choose to forgive others in the same way that God chose to forgive you. And by the way, this is the good news. The good news of great joy for all the people is a Savior is born. Right? You and I, uh, we, we are far from God. Our sins separate us from God. But God became a man and he came in and saved us. He rescued us from ourselves. And sometimes we, we hurt ourselves. We hurt others. We get caught up in hurts and habits and hang-ups without ever even intending to. Some of the dumbest things I've done in my life, when I'm done doing them, I'm like, what was I thinking? Jesus says it this way. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. A lot of times we do things that we just don't even understand why we do them. God says, I want to forgive that too. Jesus offers us forgiveness. He doesn't offer us judgment. He doesn't offer us condemnation. He's not yelling at us. He's not going to smack you up the side of the head and say, you goofball. Instead, he says, I love you, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to have a relationship with you, and that's going to require forgiveness. So peace with God This forgiveness that God offers through Jesus leads to peace within. When you know things are right between you and God, and when you know God's in control, you have a lot more confidence, a lot more peace in life. And that peace then leads you to peace with others because hurt people tend to hurt people. Hurting people tend to hurt people. So when I'm not at peace internally, when I'm not uh, uh, stable, when I'm not confident in my own life, when I'm not confident in God oftentimes I'm much more susceptible to hurting other people. But when I have peace with God, I have peace in my own life. Things are okay. 
because God's in control, then it's much easier for me to have peace with others, to implement these other elements. The peace of God is the first gift at that very first Christmas. He brings us good news, great joy, peace for all the people. It's why Jesus came, and he knows it's what you need the most. And so the end of the message is just this. Jesus told us, I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind, peace of heart. Peace of mind is that being able to live in peace. Peace of heart is that internal peace between you and God. And he said, the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. You can't find this kind of peace through your government or through uh, uh, your friends or through your family or getting another gift or more success, whatever. He says, the world can't give this gift. He says, so don't be troubled or afraid. God says, listen, I, I, I'm offering this gift to you, but every gift has to be received. Gifts aren't just thrown at you. You have to receive that gift, not because you earn it or deserve it, but just because the gift giver is good. And God says, I want to give you my peace. I want to give you forgiveness. The world can never give it to you. But Jesus gives you peace. He gives you peace, forgiveness from your past. He gives you peace from your troubles. He gives you peace from your fears. And it's a free gift that you have to receive. So I don't think it's a mistake that you're here today. I don't think it's a mistake that God threw this message up to you today. Hopefully, today's your day to accept God's peace in your life. Would you pray with me? Maybe you pray a prayer like this. Maybe you just simply say, God, I need your peace. I know I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. I live my life my own way. But I believe that Jesus paid the price for my sin and he rose again so that I could be forgiven, making peace between me and God. So Jesus, today's my day. I open my life to you. Come into my life and make me new. Give me your peace and your hope. Forgive my past. Give me hope for the future. Give me power to live my life today. Help me to be an agent of your peace in the world around me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.